Hi, this is a discussion we did with Varn Vlog recently regarding Gene Wolfe and his works and his legacy. It was so much fun, we're cross-posting it here. You can get information about the Varn Vlog Voice podcast and their YouTube channel in the show notes. And thank you, C. Derek Varn, for inviting us and being such an affable host at your place. Welcome to Barn Blog, where our aim is to give you the best in analysis and philosophy, political economy, history, art, culture, and geopolitics from a left-wing and socialist-friendly perspective. We aim to bring you different perspectives from different walks of life and to have you educate yourself what to do with what you learn here. We do not aim to give you prefabricated and easy answers. Abandon all hope, ye who subscribe here, for you will learn, and it will be your responsibility what you do. And with that, let's begin today's episode. Hello and welcome to Varn Blog Audio. And today we're with Craig and James of the Rereading Wolf podcast. As a uh, a content creator with a mild speech impediment, your title's actually a real doozy for me. But um, <laughs> You're welcome because R's and W's become the same every time I say it. And what I'm entitling this this episode is even worse because it's rereading rereading Wolf. But totally um, appropriate, absolutely yep. appropriate. I. Uh, wanted to get you on because I think I think Wolf, interestingly, is a writer whose greatness is pretty well recognized. But outside of the podcast verse, until his recent passing, I actually felt like I had seen interest in him commercially just lag. Like I, I was going into bookstores to find, you know, even like the standard set of like the new sun and it was getting harder and harder to find in a physical bookstore. And then part of that's the nature of the market. But then three podcasts, you know, started, I guess, and most of them came out of uh, the forums around uh, Wolf. Am I right about that? Like, we were the only one that I think really intentionally tried to redo some of the forums. And there's an old big, the earth list was a big mm-hmm. long email list that really was amazing and dominated any discussion of Wolf for 10, 15, maybe longer years. The other guys kind of each had their own thing. Like they, mm-hmm. they, I don't know how much they participated in a lot of that stuff, but they were just big fans. But one thing that I think James and I, kind of fell into is that once that email list kind of died out, it was harder to find one place to really get a lot of wolf discussion. And, and since we were planning on just rereading it together one time, we figured why not record it and then quickly decided let's get all the old people who used to comment there all the time and are the closest thing we kind of have to wolf scholars. Let's get them around and get them talking. And so far it's worked out pretty well. It's, it's interesting to me that there actually isn't, wolf scholarship because i I think now there's probably even neil gaiman scholarship in a formal Mm -hmm. sense but wolf scholarship has not developed in the same way even though when i talk to like you know i'm from the mfa world and so Mm -hmm. like when i talk to people about gene wolf he's one of the writers that is respected as a literary sci-fi writer Mm -hmm. um I mean, I would even say, like, on a craft level, he's he probably was one of the best writers of the late 20th century, like, just outright. So why do you think there is such a, a academic – why isn't there more Wolf scholarship, I guess? Why, why is it just, like, people from the Earth lifts and Mark Garamini? Right. Um, I think – I'll give mine, and then James may have a different answer. But I think it's a pretty simple answer, and it's mm-hmm. that – It's just hard to decide what's basically going on in the books, first of all, to then go on and do the kind of traditional things that literary criticism would do, that you have to spend so much time arguing about just what a basic plot would be or what the text 
even at a surface level kind of means that it becomes more difficult to do that. So there's a lot of legwork you have to do. First of all, just sort of establishing, here's what I think the story is then to go on and do everything else. So I think that's probably one of the big hurdles. Um, and in fact, of the stuff that has been published, if you look at it, there's a ton of sort of argumentative summary is kind of how I put it. Like Mark Aramini, who is just probably the most comprehensive guy who's written on Wolf. And he's got a four volume thing. He's got two volumes done um, and two more coming out. But he, so much of what he has to do is just sort of make a case for this is what the story, first of all, is just about. And then you can get into interpretation, cultural criticism, you know, all the various literary theory that you might apply to it. So there's there's a big uh, yeah, there's there's a big learning curve, I think, just to get started. <laughs> Is, is my yeah, I think I think that's probably the big thing is that there is no consensus about what's happening in most of his stories, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, as I, I keep bringing that up when you know we're talking to people in the in the bonus episodes. What is it about Wolf that is so unique that he can get away with story after story, novel after novel of all the debate is not about themes or symbols or social milieu it's all about well so what do you think is happening here and that's where all of the everything is being invested and so there, there really is a lot of wolf scholarship it's just I, I don't know i i couldn't say how much academic scholarship there really is but i think it's probably uh all relegated to to what's happening uh, there's peter wright majority of book, it, yeah. right mm -hmm. he's mm -hmm. and it, his his book is all about explaining what's really happening in the story. Even on um, Olton's library, the, the website, mm -hmm. uh, olton.org, a lot of the stories are really about what's happening. Although a lot of the of Michael Andre Driussi's uh, stuff is actually breaking things down. What are, the, mm -hmm. what are the animals in the story? What are the flowers in the story? So it's, uh, there is... There is a fair amount of scholarship on one wolf book, and I, I th it's interesting which one it is. It's not The New Sun. It, it's uh, The Fifth Heaven Sybaris, mm -hmm. partly mm -hmm. because of post-colonial studies mm -hmm. and partly because at least two parts of that book are a little bit more straightforward in what's going on, although when you add them together, they're not. Uh, so yeah. Um, yeah. that middle story is uh, is the thing that throws you for a loop, but it's that is that's the that's the thing that seems academically approachable whereas you throw someone the new sun it's it's done or even or even like Le the latro books which i don't think are the most difficult of the wolf books even though they're pretty difficult in mm -hmm. some ways um like but you can not... usually agree about what's happening because yeah. you're, you you have a source text to follow along with mm-hmm Right. Yeah. The, the the mythology is mythology that you know. It's not like the new sun where there's there's an entire world that you are divorced from, and that wolf has actually seemingly flushed out in his head and not shared. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, and there's the other thing too that you can suggest, and I think a lot of people will assume that maybe this is it, but there's a sense still that wolf is sort of not in line with the times, I guess you could say that he's more of a conservative writer. And I think that may be something that might worry some people about getting into it. The difficulty I always have is that people say that because in interviews, he said that that's what he was. But if you try and find that in the actual books, it's hard <laughs> because again, <laughs> to try and figure out like what actually he's arguing or saying in the books is is a big step but um i think that's that's an assumption that a lot of people have and that that you'll still see pop up every now and then i mean back when the the whole puppies thing went on in the hugo and nebula awards which i don't know i don't know if you know about that but i it's, remember that yeah okay yeah so it's a big thing where where essentially sort of before the before i guess what they would call the alt-right or whatever there was a small group of people who complained that the Hugo and the Nebula Awards were predominantly becoming less sort of literary quality and more political, like, yeah, political. Woke. Awards. Just generally yeah. woke. Yeah. Right, right. That that was the argument. And so a lot of people said, well, Wolf is, would be on the side of the puppies. And so they, <laughs> they, they classed him as one of the, the guys who would be for them. I don't know how many people agree with that completely, but it is something that especially people who 
haven't read Wolf will often say that. Like if you just search for Wolf on Twitter, you'll often see him sort of listed among like, oh yeah, a conservative guy like Wolf. And you're like, well, you know, what does that mean? You know, in, and yeah, Wolf called himself a conservative, but what he meant by that is probably not what anyone in the last 20, 40 years means by that. So, yeah. so a it's a totally that, different thing. Yeah. It feels like he's, when by conservative, he means conservative Catholic more than politically conservative. And even that's hard to find in the stories. So, yeah. I mean, like, the, yeah. what is it? The, the book of the new sun is basically a Gnostic world. It's heretical <laughs> from a Catholic point of view, like in almost every sense. Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing people say is, oh, he's a Catholic writer. So what he had must obviously be fit with Catholic orthodoxy. Some people think so. James and I have found many examples where we're like, how does this even <laughs> like the, yeah, it's yeah. Who knows? So, I mean, um, but that's still an assumption that I think is an easy way to classify him sometimes. And I suppose that could be one reason why there's, there's not as much writing about it, but I, I really do think it's more the practical thing of, of just once you start waiting in there, there's a lot of questions you have to answer before you get to any sort of straightforward claims or, or, interpretations or criticism. And, and, you know, it's really ironic though, because if you break down actually a lot of the events and themes and characters in his novels and stories, there is a lot of gender uh, bending, gender uh, barrier busting that if it were a younger writer and with a slightly different tone, rather than, you know, a Mm -hmm. man who was born in 1931 then if people would say, oh, wow, this is revolutionary. This is, uh, this, it would be seen as super woke. It, maybe the sad puppies would I mean, think that it was another yeah. example of that. So, yeah, you can make a case that Severian, the main character of the book of the new sun, he's in some sense, a trans character as the, yeah. as the book goes on. Well, there's I a mean, romantic scene with, with, with Latro in soldier yeah. of the mist with yeah. a, with a man who has a woman inside of him. So, yeah. or, and changes into a woman. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's so much of that. There's also this concern that Wolf has about the the humanity of things that are not obviously human are things that have been genetically mm-hmm. altered. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's a very big theme in the early work, and I, I actually think it's also like a theme in stuff like the Book of the Long Sun, where it really seems to like we have tree people that may or may not be people, like, but they're. Mm. Mm-hmm. Wolf clearly thinks they're people and might have a soul, but but like, are they by our standards? Clearly not. So, um, those, uh, but you know that w- it wouldn't be just be Wolf. I think about like people going into the appendix and literature from D and D and thinking they're you know it's all none of its messages. It's all like sword and sorcery written by barbarians for barbarians. <laughs> yeah. um, and you go back and read that stuff. And a lot of that's message literature too, both conservative and liberal. I mean, mm-hmm. it goes in both directions somewhat radically. You know, another interesting thing about Wolf is you might, many people might be put off by the fact he claims to be a conservative. He's definitely very Catholic. Personally, when I talk about the fifth head of Sybaris, he's also generally considered to have written one of the better books by a, well, to put it frankly, a white dude about <laughs> colonialism that was hyper aware and sympathetic of things like, like racial limiting, gender limiting and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. He's, he's very aware of that. I mean, he seems to be aware of it from a Catholic lens. I mean, I do think in that book, it's very much tied up in his visions of like they're in hell, but yeah. it's, but in, but to follow on the post-colonial thing, the third story of fifth head of Cerberus is so much really about, the damage that happens after you have these sort of mixings and, and unfair and, and un yeah. I mean, I know oh, shoot. What's the word? Ah, the cool word now for, for sort of power imbalances. I totally forgot, but, um, Inequity? but <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, there's something else that I've seen oh. thrown around, but, um, I mean, that third story in, in there is so much about the damage that the quote unquote aboriginals, have and and how they're trying to find an identity and they're stuck with the identity that the colonists sort of brought and and trying to just realize that you know you may never be able to get out of this again and that's that's hell but it's also this sort of culturally produced hell that happens right, at yeah. the same time and it just becomes incredibly complicated like that's that's sort of the problem is that it's it's it, it's a mess <laughs> yeah yeah well I, I, I look far be it from me 
to uh, undercut any uh, any uh, modernism uh, interpret- mm-hmm. interpretation on on Wolf's writings, but I've never really seen the Fifth House Cerberus as a conventional uh, colonialist story. I feel mm-hmm. like it's it's totally its own thing. Wolf, and that's the big thing about Wolf is that he's not interested in your culture war. He's got his own that we kind of discussed best uh, early on in the podcast that, you know, Wolf's uh, cultural debates are from the fifth century and his <laughs> politics were out of step with, uh, you know, his other conservatives in 1980. And I've always seen the fifth head of Cerberus as a story about how the land colonizes the colonizers. Mm-hmm. You, you think you've conquered the land, but in fact, the land has conquered you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think it's, I think this is also the interpretive richness of Wolf because you can, that text, and it's one of the texts where I think you kind of do know what's going on, sort of. Um, I mean, there, there are, there are questions of who is, what is, are these people actually the Aboriginal uh, mm-hmm. race? Are they not? Um, who's a clone? <laughs> like, yeah. um, but it's not like, say, the Lamb of the Cross where, <laughs> we don't even know what character motivations are. Right. Are, <laughs> but it's an amazing, it's amazing novel that doesn't really exist on the page. It exists somewhere between mm-hmm. these three novellas, yeah. and th- that in that way, it's it's really unique. It's groundbreaking as far as reimagining the novel itself. Yeah, but and just to point out with that one alone, just the the difference of ways that people approach it. Um, like I don't think. James or I agree with it, but one thing that I found fascinating about the Gene Wolfe Literary Podcast, one of the other ones, was when they went through Fifth Head of uh, Cerberus, their way they kind of ended up was that they think that any of the sort of speculative fiction aspects of it, like these other sort of magical aborigines, they think that ends up not being real. That it's really just a sort of story of basically kind of it's science fiction. It's in the future, but it's basically realism. It's just these people have created these legends to sort of justify some of the horrible things that they've done. And there are ways that the book supports that. Um, Mm -hmm. But then there are also totally different, wild, crazy, speculative things about magical third races that that you know, can take on identities and um, of different people and copy them and copy them so well that they even forget that they're copies of the people. Um, and that's in the book too, as just mm-hmm. a, an explanation of what the basic story is. Um, and it's pretty amazing to have a writer who can support, you know, <laughs> so many wildly different just summaries of what the book's about. And I mean, that's sort of the basic thing about Wolf that fascinates me um, of just the, the sheer sort of surface variability that can be there, but you still want to read it and the stories still work and they still are engaging narratives just in a straightforward way. Um, That's something that I find so rarely uh, that sort of constant fascination and confusion at the same time. It it is interesting that, uh, when you approach Wolf, the, the, there is such a richness of interpretation that it's 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 hard. I mean, we talk about the, the the almost inability to even figure out the basic plot because a lot of the plot does hinge on your interpretation of events. Because Wolf has become kind of the master of, and I don't know anyone else who's actually as good at this. And I mean this sincerely. Um, where the novel are the 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 plot is what is not said almost more than it ever is what is said. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are other authors who can pull that off, but I don't know of anyone who can pull it off as, as engagingly. And it Mm -hmm. doesn't also, it doesn't feel like a gimmick actually ever. Um, And it's hard to, to imagine. (laughs) I also think like, man, when you think about, reading because you know I, i'm 40 but i'm nowhere near old enough to have read these when they came out but i i was like what would if i'd approach book of the new sun and with its original cover and like when it was originally released in the 80s i don't even know what i would have done like <laughs> like it yeah. would have totally broke my brain i think yeah. well that's, we talked about that like when we finished shadow of the torture the first volume mm-hmm. we had so much fun because the book ends on a cliffhanger of sorts and the second book doesn't address it at all 
uh, just <laughs> begins a couple days later and almost refuses to address that the last book ended on a cliffhanger and never really comes back like a standard story would. And it's like, okay, kidding. Let's actually figure all this stuff out. <laughs> this um, is what actually happened. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it just doesn't do that. And when you think about how it was published as like one small, small paperback that set up this world and then people were going to go out and buy the second one. And then there were two more that were going to follow after that and being totally fooled and confused. You know, there's still something else about the way that he can tell stories that he can absolutely refuse to pay off anything that you think you're being set up for, but still want to go buy the next book. And yeah, that's why it's remarkable. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I keep bringing this up over and over that Wolf is kind of, he's, there's three miracles involved in Wolf. One is that he wrote that way and felt like, okay, I'm going to write this way and we'll just see what happens. And then there's, you know, the editors that the editors let him write that way and said, okay, accept it. And then that the readers actually accepted it and said, this is not, you know, they didn't say, this is crazy. This is not the way you write a, a novel, yeah. not a fantasy novel. And that's one thing we've asked, like we've talked to a bunch of different, um, writers who knew wolf and those are sort of some of our bonus episodes but the one thing that i think both james and i keep trying to push him on is okay what did his editors actually think about this like did they get him to explain the story and then they were like oh okay great um and no they did no they, they <laughs> like said, okay it's it's a wolf story yeah, yeah, and Swanwick yeah. even told a story. Michael Swanwick told a story about how he thinks one of the, or as he recalled, like uh, Gardner Dozois had a story given to him, and he's like, "I have no clue what's going on," and <laughs> finally, I have a story that makes me think that someone was in control and has a meaning for it, but I can't figure it out. I have to buy it, and you're like, "Wow!" And you know, Gardner Dozois like controlled the editorship of such a huge part of genre fiction. But if he was making that kind of decision too, then yeah, then Wolf at that point, I think had sort of carte blanche to just keep doing that kind of thing and writing yeah, these I, I, yeah, I guess stories. David Knife was kind of encouraging him really mm -hmm. to, 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 to follow that particular path. It, yeah. When he put out the changeling, he compared it favorably to Shirley Jackson's The Lottery and mm -hmm. said, I, I can't tell you what this story is about, but I think it means something. So, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because I do think like the only novel that I've ever uh, um, read of Wolf's where I automatically knew what it was about was the one that he just disavowed. And um, <laughs> and uh, it's also the only that. one. Yeah, it's also the only one where the politics are apparent, but also they don't map. They actually don't really map on the conventional conservative or liberal politics mm -hmm. from today, like at all. But yeah, um, I, I, to Wolf, that was conservative politics, and it and no, no, I'm sorry, Wolf, you don't understand conservatives <laughs> at all either. <laughs> I mean, he's he, he does have this very he's very concerned about working people. He's very concerned about the reinstanti the reinstantiation of slavery comes up a lot in mm -hmm. his. Mm -hmm. um, he was clearly anti communist, but it's it's. Uh, he was also internationalist in a lot of when it comes up. Like it's 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 interesting to see. Um he when a, he I think he said over and over, he's he was interested in in power and mm -hmm. the people who had power and people who used power mm -hmm. or to dominate others. And he was kind of uh kind of loosey goosey after that. I remember actually uh someone asked him about his politics in a in a panel one time. Actually it wasn't you can't really call it a panel. There wasn't even a moderator moderator. It was just him. <laughs> and he said and so they asked and he just kind of sighed and he said the politics I believe in is democracy. America is not a democracy. It's never been. We're a republic. That means that every so often we elect people to rule over us. And when we have, you can believe they know it. And that was the end of his, that's his <laughs> politics. Yeah. I mean, that can go like you, Ursula K. Le Guin, who is, you know, clear anarcho-communist can buy into that too. And yeah, that's, sure. Sure. Um, it's, it's interesting um, how much war factors into his, that, that is a theme that I think comes mm -hmm. up almost, it's almost ubiquitous. Um <laughs> I mean, Severian is arguably indirectly a product of some kind of war. Um, 
Yeah. And, and the entire fourth book is, you know, a young man goes to the front basically. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's the, the story. But yeah. That, and that, that introduction to the fourth volume uh, where he talks about what war is described. That is beautiful. That is mm-hmm. beautiful prose. And uh, I tell you what, it, it, and it, it comes off as a testimony from somebody who's been there. And I want to bother reading it, but I uh, check it out that first, the first uh, two paragraphs of the Citadel of the Autark. Yeah. And there's a really fun little uh, volume. It's called letters home, but it's a short volume of letters that he wrote back to his mother, as I recall, right? Is mm-hmm. it, it wasn't a Rosemary. It was to, to his mother um, while he was in the Korean war. And that's the big thing. He was, he did fight in Korea in the Korean war. And um, you mentioned the story of the changeling, which is also about someone who's come home after that and obviously has extreme PTSD of some form. And just the, the, horrors of trying to fit back into regular society. But the yeah, letters, he described having gone through that himself yeah, when he came yeah, back. He was yeah. said he was a mess. Absolutely. And that book Letters Home is really interesting because he's still obviously very young and and just trying to survive and make sense. Um, but it does give you a sense of you know how I at least for me when I read it, how raw a lot of that it those those experiences were affecting him. And it it's the kind of thing that you you'd absolutely see from then on. I mean, like some of the scenes where Severian describes what's going on in the actual battle and how chaotic it is and how terrifying it is. I mean, are absolutely terrifying. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, that if it wasn't with, you know, mad (laughs) magical futuristic Valkyries flying around and other creatures riding on other shoulders, you'd put that right next to a lot of good Vietnam war writing. I think, yeah, I think Wolf's, the, the the protagonists that work best with wolf it's a it's usually a male and not but not always but usually a male and it is a man who is lost and trying to rediscover who he is mm-hmm. and that's that comes down boils down to severian it boils down to number 5 it boils down to uh, and vrt as well it boils down to certainly to latro Mm-hmm. And to uh, the narrator of the book of the short sun, and maybe mm-hmm. Silk too. Yeah, yeah, and that's very much that sense I get of yeah, a young man who's gone through this sort of overwhelming experience and has to put himself back together in some way. And yeah, that's mm-hmm. sort of the pattern you see in his protagonists over and over. So I feel like that's really probably in the end he does have plenty of direct writing about war, but it's more that experience of trying to, I think, put yourself back together or figure out just what's going on or where you fit into a world that isn't anything like you used to think it was. That's yeah. That, that's he literalizes that thing. over and over and over again. I mean, I mm-hmm. think in the short stories too, it's a constant thing. And right. so, um, in the Island of Dr. Death and other stories and other stories, um, you have that, one of the few times in the first, I think it's the first in that cycle where, where you have it set contemporaneously with peace and it's about childhood. It's not about war, but it's about childhood trauma and um, exposure to things you probably shouldn't be exposed to when you're eight. Mm-hmm. Um, but he clearly also understands that that kind of trauma and war trauma are related. Mm-hmm. Um, and he can, tease that out and I, I, and he was doing that at a time where that was not that common in literature to do i mean this was what i guess this would have been what the early 70s when he wrote that maybe the late 60s it's early uh, it was like 70 yeah 1970 mm-hmm. yeah 71 um and then you you think of something like peace which i, I guess you can argue whether or not it's supernatural or not or mm-hmm. if it's just someone who's completely mind broke um <laughs> Uh, of all the stories, that's it's the one where I'm like, well, they both completely, utterly work. <laughs> like, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Once um, again, it's it, and it is that's once again a protagonist trying to find himself. Maybe yeah. he's, maybe he'd be better off not finding him, but yeah. he uh, he may be too late. Friend, but yeah. 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 But yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's the one too that Neil Gaiman famously talks about, where he read it once and thought it was just a nice little. You know, midwestern story about memoir. a midwest yeah midwestern memoir and then you read it again and it's a horror novel and right. yeah so so it works both ways mm-hmm. uh I'm, yeah i think about the the soldier stories are, are interesting like that they they read they have read different to me every time i've read them um 
how horrific they are. You know, the first time I read them, I think I was just so puzzled, even though it was, it's a fairly, for Wolf, it's actually one of the simpler conceits. Um, but uh, I'm like, oh, this is Memento, but like way smarter. And in, mm-hmm. in, in, <laughs> yeah. in, in ancient, and in ancient Greece and Egypt, um, yep. Yep. Uh, it may or may not involve gods. Um, <laughs> so, um, but it was, that story um, those stories come off differently when I was thinking about them in the context of trauma and not just trying to piece the puzzles together. Although both yeah. are really fun. I mean, that's the thing about Wolf. Like I enjoy doing both. I mean, particularly when you get to the, all the sun books, it's just like, okay, there's, there's all the psychological wit- richness here. It's also objectively insane. And do I trust the narrator? Is the narrator one person? And um, is his memory messed up? Because he's lying to me because he does seem to have a, a, a idiotic memory most of the time. Um, or is he multiple people? I mean, you guys go through this over and over and over again on the mm-hmm. show. Yeah. Um, but that's why the rereading part of it is so, so important because I, I with, with all stories, you should read them more than once. But if you, if you're reading a wolf story once, you have no idea what you read. I think that's no, like, my, it's, it's my least fun time to read it but that's the, the after when i read it the first time i'm i'm paranoid i'm i'm <laughs> lost i'm irritated i said what yeah. the heck and it's, so yeah it's, it's only after you get to the end where there's and there's and in some places it can be boring where places it's really not yeah but you read it the first time and you have these long stretches and it feels like nothing's happening well it isn't but it's happening off off page or it's happening, you know, kind of in the spaces between what's going on. You can't really know that until you get an idea of where the story is going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And same with like New Sun, because the one part that or two, there are two parts that everyone talks about skipping over a lot of time the first time they read it, because there's the Brown Book stories, which is mm-hmm. there's a book in the book there that tells pieces of history and old legends and myths, but in almost unrecognizable ways, but entire chapters are taken up with those stories. And um, there's a storytelling contest too, that does something similar in the fourth book. But so you have these breaks where there are just these stories that can seem completely sideways and you have no idea what they do with anything. And there's also an incredibly long play um, in the middle of the second book that is obviously an allegorical play of something, but you have no context for what most of this stuff does. And he just drops these things in there a lot of the times in places where you absolutely don't want to interrupt the action. So you read those, you skip those the first time, a lot of times is what people do. Um, But then the second, third times you read them, once you know what those little things are doing, you spend so much time trying to read these little things that on the surface have absolutely nothing to do with the story. But the more you piece them together, the more rich they seem and and the more opportunities. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've probably spent when I was reading it the second and third time, I spent more time trying to figure out the Brown book stories on new sun than I did the, the main story itself. Yeah. If you could crack that play, you would know what's going on mm-hmm. in the book of the new sun. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> what's going on in, in that in the book of new sun don't say that, that play. we got we to talk about it here in a few episodes so. <laughs> well hopefully i'll figure it out that's usually how it works <laughs> if i do so uh it's it's interesting um because when i when i when i talk to people about wolf and i try to make a um a literary comparison to him it's in one way that the you, you come up with someone like Octavia Butler or Ursula K. Le Guin or, you know, people that you would think. Um, but then I'm like, John Kennedy O'Toole, um, Confederacy of Dunces, uh, uh, G.K. Chesterton, um, Proust as read if Proust wrote Jack Vance. I get like, <laughs> no, that's good. That's a good that's way a good to, one. for yeah. a new son, absolutely. Yeah, yeah put yeah. that on the cover. Yeah. And um, I mean, um, the other one who's been mentioned a lot lately seemed Nabokov, like some of, of his, yeah, definitely Nabokov. especially Pale Fire, uh, is one that I think that, that a lot of people mention. Um, no idea if Wolf actually did Wolf read Nabokov. I can't remember. I don't know. Um, but, or if you mentioned him at all, he but, should, he should yeah. look, they, they seem like kindred spirits. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Just where, where there's so many games going on before you get to mm-hmm. the, the, the thrust of whatever it is. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting if people try to read Wolf didactically. I mean, like you think about Severian. 
I don't know if I think Severian's a good guy, like at all. Even at the, even at the end uh, of the see story. You're, you, yeah. you, you, here, well, here, 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 Craig, show him the other half of your talisman. They right, just yeah. Got it, so. <laughs> but yeah, that's, I mean, he's a torturer, right? And there are plenty right. of people who say they just couldn't get into the books because I'm, I'm being asked to see things through the eyes of a torturer. And he's, you know, and, and he justifies it throughout the first book because that's the world that he's been raised and, and lived in. Um, and even though he comes to reform it by the end of it and have different opinions, it's, it's not the kind of fully satisfying, you know, I now renounce where I was, you know, it's more, and the way the reasons why he goes against torture are, as he says, not because torture itself is evil, but, because it forces good men to do bad things, mm. which is not the kind of justice that we think, you know, a good guy should have, especially not one who's obviously being compared to a Christ figure throughout the whole book. So, so it's always challenging like that. Everything about him. I mean, there's no, I mean, it's sort of a, a truism for people to say the complex stories or complex, good high literature is going to be difficult about, you know, good and evil, not being simple things, but, um, Sometimes even the markers of how you would judge people in Wolf get incredibly confused. And I feel like that's very intentional because one thing he talked about was that he was trying to write what he saw as basically realist stories in the sense of always being from a certain perspective. And the one thing about people is and living within certain perspectives is that we're always wrong and we always have an incomplete context, but we still have to live and make decisions and do things and whatnot. And um, so part of the confusion I think that is in so many of his stories is because that's how Wolf kind of saw, call it moral realism, um, that, that even though we can sort of sit back and make abstractions sometimes, the actual experience of engaging with the world is always way more complicated than you could ever imagine. So that's where it gets weird, like when you were talking about him being a Catholic, where, yeah, he was a Catholic, but how that actually translates into his stories is super, super weird and complicated because even he would say, I may be a Catholic, but I'm still human. And so even if I do think I know what truth with a capital T might be, the way that I access that is always through my incredibly limited perspective. And so you have stories where the it's always confusing, where even mm -hmm. someone can have an entire universe basically tell you that you're the savior, but you don't look like it. And so he's God's and, executioner. And, right. Yeah. That's and you're like, okay, well, how do, how do I deal with this? What is, what's going on here? And, and part of that, I think at least part of the real fun of Wolf is leaving you in situations where there are not that it's just ambiguous, but there aren't even clear markers by which you could do it, but you still feel the pressure to make good and bad decisions and to be a good person. Um, and, and that's a really interesting dynamic that I don't think you see quite so often. I think about that a lot with him because you're right. The moral valences are always off yet. There mm -hmm. are moral valences. These are not, mm -hmm grim, dark, amoral stories ever. Right. right. Even in situations that are, uh, you know, I mean, Fifth Head of Cerberus is objectively horrifying. The entire mm -hmm. setup is, is, is awful, but, but people are still moral agents in that, even though there doesn't seem like there is a way to be good. It's kind of an obviously complicated moral universe, but you, you get to something like peace. It's even more so. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the narrator of peace, you both, have other sympathy with and other repulsion at the same time, almost, yeah. almost entirely through the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's true with Severian too. Like I, I'm the more that James and I read it, the less I'm convinced that, that we're supposed to see Severian as good or bad. Like I just see him as always, he, he does want to be better. He thinks that what he's trying to do is be better all the time. But that doesn't mean that this is going to be a nice sort of, you know, buildings Roman where over time he obviously gets objectively better. And by the end of it, he's learned his lessons and we can map out, you know, how, how we should model our lives on Severian or something like that. And yeah. I don't, I don't think Wolf even thought that was possible. Um, that that's not, that's sort of not what I guess you could say moral experience is ever like. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Wolf so, is, go ahead. It, Wolf regularly puts a, a great deal of distance between himself as the author and the the main character from mm -hmm. which we view that story. Sometimes they're not human. Sometimes 
they are they're, sometimes they're a torturer yeah. uh, in a in an evil society where that is the best thing you can be. Sometimes he's a, he's a soldier who doesn't even know who he is. He's just wandering around. I have all kinds of theories about you know who the the characters are in the, the fifth out of Cerberus. But one of those one of the things about them is that I do believe that there's a great deal of distance between Wolf and the ma- a human being and those characters. He doesn't yeah. see. I don't think he sees them that, that way. And yeah, he's he's a bit of a torturer himself as he scientifically goes about tearing apart those characters. Yeah. Yeah. I always think too, it's important to remember that even though people will talk about Wolf being Catholic or being conservative or something, he was a science fiction, speculative fiction writer first. And so he's making up things that are not just veiled lectures. Right. I mean, not even in a complicated way. I don't think like he truly is creating worlds that, that ask a lot of questions and that I feel like they're most interesting when they sort of pose problems with easy solutions, but they're, it's not like there's, it's not like there's a hidden theology. I feel like belief behind all these things that if you could just figure out, you'd be like, ah, this is the map of the world that Wolf has offered us. And and it was fun to figure it out, but here it is. And here's how he thinks we should be good and what the truth is. When I don't think that's at all what's going on in his books. He's not CS Lewis in it for sure. Um, Yeah. No. Why do you think that the Book of the New Sun is so many people's introduction to to Wolf? Because as an introduction to Wolf, it's kind of a weird place to start. Mm-hmm. Well, it it looks like a a kind of book you've you've seen before. It has all the tropes. It has all the things that would uh, would attract you. It's 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 based around a very basic uh fantasy hero he's got a cape he's shirtless he's got got a sword (laughs) um he was wolf says he was literally designed to be easily put together so that people could cosplay him Mm -hmm. um yeah there's all kinds of reasons why that would be the the most attractive um i did i i've as i've often said it when i read the fifth uh, the uh, book of the new sun I was impressed with the world building, but I came away thinking, hey, he's a so-so writer. And uh, <laughs> it, But it wasn't until I read The Fifth Head of Cerberus, I said, oh, I get it. Okay, now I see. And that, then I went, oh, he, no, he's he's the best science fiction writer ever. He's the, No one needs to continue pumping these things out because he's got it. He's got it whipped. So, um, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. It's other people. A lot of people have said, well, you know. It have bounced off of it so many times. You got to wonder yeah. whether it is a good choice, but it tends to be the one that hooks the most people who get hooked. A lot of most yeah. people do bounce off of it and never go back. Yeah. And I think too, it's easy to sort of summarize and catch phrases like this is science fantasy. And that's how I think for a long time, Wolf was seen as, oh, he's the master of science fantasy rather than either science fiction or fantasy. And that may or may not be true. Um, but also, you know, you have a, the torture is, the lead is the main character. And so that's obviously against what you would expect. And then it gets the, I, it gets the reputation of, Oh, and this is a, a weird sort of Christian allegory where that torture guy is going to be a Christ figure. And so you've got all these sort of strange summary things that are, are kind of put around it, um, which don't actually play out that way quite so easily when you, when you read it, but it's, it's easier to summarize in these sort of extreme paradoxes, I think. And yeah. I think that does it. But then you could too, pretend to say, "What is?" If someone asks you, "What is this about?" You can actually take a yeah. shot at it, and that's yeah. not always easy to do with a lot of Wolf novels. Yeah. And then too, I think that of all of his books, to me at least, it's the one series with the most sort of jaw dropping set pieces of just these images and situations that are super memorable that once you get into it and a lot of go with it, it has, I mean, things that are just incredibly visual, um, incredibly dramatic. Uh, even if you can't piece together the whole story, you can remember the mountains that the entire mountain range, that's all carved into statues of the Kings, yeah. or you can remember the giant, the tyrant who came back to life for a second and who, Severian had to have like his, you know, wrestling with the devil in the desert moment or something like that. Or, or, the or abstinent- Severian coming into the forest camp, riding a, a giant beluga a theory giant with elephant a, with, creature, with yeah. having beheaded the driver. And yeah, uh, yeah. so <laughs> it's got a, it's got a ton of stuff. I mean, it's just I think it's just fun. Like, it's just one of the most absolutely fun books 
to read. And we talk about all the time how the chapters seem like they they just wildly vacillate back and forth between, you know, incredibly cool Conan moments to very confusing philosophical asides to weird troubling emotional situations and you'll have all that in like seven pages. Um, so it's, it really is just an incredibly fun book. And I have a feeling that's probably why new son. I also, I mean, Mark Aramini, again, he, he just thinks that, and, and I kind of agree with him that for whatever reason, when Wolf was writing this one, he was touched. Like it just, mm. it has a, an aura about it that everything else is, is wonderful. But this one, for whatever reason, just captures people's imagination. It's kind of like there's the, the story people talk about is he's got the librarian in the beginning who the way you become a member of the Guild of the Librarians is you happen upon a book of gold that just, mm. just and totally engrosses you. And it has that quality. There's so many people just get lost in it and they're like, this is the most fascinating thing I've ever encountered. <laughs> and yeah. And so, I, you know, what that actually is craft wise, I have no idea. You know, if, <laughs> if you knew, then I would be a great MFA professor. <laughs> but, um, yeah. But it does, it has that, that quality to it. It's it is interesting because I actually can't imagine people imitating Wolf. Like it, it mm. seems it seems damn near impossible to do. Mm-hmm. Um, no one bothers trying. I mean, the people people do follow his light. I mean, you can see it in Gaiman. Uh, we mm. just we just recently talked to Ada Palmer. Mm-hmm. Uh, she is rather open in in following the light, yeah. but no one is trying to be the next Wolf. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah and that's. That's kind of rare, actually, <laughs> and, and particularly in even in highly literary genre fiction, it's kind of rare that no, there's no clear analog. There's no one trying to mythos you. There's no expanded. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine an expanded new certain universe, but like we wouldn't even agree on what it could be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We've had one person send us a piece of quote unquote fan fiction about it um mm-hmm. but even that was so very different i mean it was it was really cool but it was sort of another another world altogether um that was connected but yeah i don't i haven't ever encountered you know somebody else taking one of severian's friends stories and going on with it you but know, that's that that's that something that we want to do that's something i want oh, yeah. to do we want, i oh. want to have a flash fiction contest pick one character and then everyone has to write a story about their background and i mean the one we always pick is awesome. is agia because we can't agree with what mm-hmm. her backstory is yeah uh, you know yeah. is she you know, is she a robot is she uh from the mirrors from the botanic gardens is, yeah. is she a from the from the north it just she's just a rag shop girl all of these yeah. things work yeah and it, it would be hard to do like if you decided that you were going to try and be a writer who didn't tell stories on the surface but the real story was something that a reader would have to piece together behind the scenes but the surface story still needs to be engaging enough to make people think they understand it and to keep turning the pages and you're going to sell it to a mass genre market that's, right that's, yeah that's, i mean <laughs> like, yeah it's it's first of all yeah how it's it's amazing that it sells at all but then yeah to actually do that i mean you have to have beyond confidence and so i don't i can't imagine too many people really why do you think you never won a hugo i don't know what is it about the hugo so gr uh, george r R. martin uh actually brought this up when he was uh debating the uh the cause of the of the sad puppies it says look you know we don't always quality doesn't always win out for awards gene wolf never won a hugo Mm -hmm. um and martin is obviously a fan yeah, I was brought that up that uh, on the Facebook group at one point. So you know, he got nominated, I think, for mm-hmm. Sword of the Lictor, or maybe it was called the Ancillary. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. But you know, after the novel was done and uh, Citadel Autark came out, didn't even get a nod. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it, the Hugos are weird, right? Because the Hugos are um, those are more of a popularity award, but like the world fantasy award, the nebula, the locus awards, those Those are are the writers. Those are the writers doing things. So, yeah. And I think too, I mean, as popular as Wolf was, he was never the super top bestseller, right? Oh yeah. He he, He was always kind of seen as like a writer's writer or a hard writer or something like that. So, Mm -hmm. So they always it, called him a writer's writer. But I remember right. that being asked a couple times. In, yeah. In, what does it mean to be a writer's writer? And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it is hard. I mean, our whole thing is like 
we even say it in the beginning of the show that that it's only you're only reading him when you reread him and if that's the case that's you know that's asking a lot of people so it's not not going to be a fun beach page turner for a lot of people my introduction to wolf was actually the short stories um and that it is Mm -hmm. because the need to reread them because those convinced me that the novels were worth it Mm -hmm. um because i'm like okay i'm gonna have to read this four times at least um, it'll be short. <laughs> I, I my my I think my first discovery of him was a, a story that I can't remember the title of, and it was in one of those like nightshade books collected apocalypse fictions that mm-hmm. was kind of randomly thrown together with some Stephen King, and I I knew who he was. Um, Sob in the silence. Yes, actually, that's it. Yeah. Um, and and I just I hit that story and I read it and I'm like, wait, what? And then I read it again. I'm like, this is amazing, but I, I don't know. And then I read it again. And I remember I'm like, I'm just going to keep rereading this story. And there's like nine other authors. Okay. I got to, I got to track everything down. And then I found, I heard about Book of the New Sun and I was afraid of it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and then I, I uh, started with the soldier in the mist and was fascinated with that went through the wizard night and then read the book of new sun. And then I read fifth head and you know, fifth head is actually probably my favorite, but mm-hmm. I was just like, wow, how, why was I not taught this in school? was actually my first thought. And I was like, <laughs> I've been taught. I was like, Hey, look, when it's okay to teach genre fiction now, why aren't they teaching? this? <laughs> yeah. Well, so many people, especially other writers talk about it was the short stories that won people over. And it was, I mean, fifth head is a, uh, a mock-up, right? It was the first story was written as a separate novella, and then they basically asked him to write two more to put it together. So even that's not officially or technically a novel, right? He got his sort of fame and success from doing that, and it's almost like if he hadn't been so good of a short story writer and gotten so many editors and other writers to support him, there's no way he could have tried something like Peace or New Sun that that it just it wouldn't have sold if he hadn't already. I guess, proven himself to that whole, you know, obviously back then much smaller genre writing community that he could pull something off that, that he did. But yeah, yeah, I don't, the I don't were... even know how another wolf can even arise. Oh yeah. Given but, the, the, the tanking of the anthology market. Yeah. Yeah. And the short stories are what made him, I mean, the short, like initially, like I, I don't think he would have had David Hartwell, who is his main editor, on his side when he was writing New Sun, if he didn't have all those short stories already out there. And so he just wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have sold. He wouldn't have had an editor who was pushing for it. Yeah, the tanking of the anthology market, the, 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 the marginal end of the book market, because, you know, he would, he's a mid tail seller. He's not, it'd be harder to take a risk on it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And one of my side gigs is actually publishing. And so, like, it's a, it's a, partly because I'm a poet and I publish poetry, but partly also I actually publish like nonfiction with a, uh, with zero books and our profit margins are basically ex- sort of existent. <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Um, so yeah. it's, it, well, if you it, can't even hope to resell the story as a movie <laughs> or a TV series, then, right. you know, where's the, where's the profit going to come from? Yeah. And I do think he's unfilmable. I, yeah. I actually do think he is. Well, everybody talks about things that are unfilmable, and they mentioned like Dune, but I'm like, I don't think you can film. The perspective's too important, and I don't know how camera mm-hmm. could do it. You could yeah. rip him off and make a movie, right? You could still have a torturer story where he falls in love with a woman in a, in a cell, but it wouldn't be Severi, and it wouldn't yeah. be Book of the New Sun. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you would have to make decisions to show something visually that there are so many times that to know what's going on or not know what's going on depends on literally how you take the meaning of particular words. What happens at Perilous Gate? No one agrees. Right. What happens at Morwenna's execution? We kind of agree. So the fact that you would have to settle something in a visual format rather than to leave it vague in the way that it's told from one person. Yeah. Already it would be a different, a totally different thing. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the most under red wolf? that you know you want people to read more people are reading peace now and at least i see a lot more people on forums and discussions doing but i think for a while it was something that only sort of the hardcore fans would read because it it is 
Midwestern life, right? There's no, there's no torturer in a dying earth with a, you know, magic gym in his boot, right? <laughs> it's there, or, or an ancient soldier dealing with gods. There's, you don't have that. And it's really about this one kid who had a troubled childhood, right? And, and interacted with odd, with odd people um, throughout his life with weird ants. Um, so it may it, or may not be unstuck in time. Right. But. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and I mean, that's the one sort of speculative thing that you get there, but it's also perfectly easy just to say, oh, he's just mem- remembering things mm. and it's a memoir. So that's one that I think for a long time I was afraid would never really be read, but it does now seem like a lot of Wolf fans have, have read it. And I don't know if that's because literally as simple as Neil Gaiman, you know, talking about how much he loves it, that could be part of it. Um, but so I think that's a win as far as which ones aren't being read. I don't know. Do you have a sense, James, of which well, ones you'd like? I, I, the, I would, it tends to be just about anything that people aren't reading. I think they, they could be read a lot more. An evil guest. There's mm-hmm. a lot of really, yeah. really good stuff in that. A lot of world building stuff, a lot of, um, people don't like uh, the main character because Wolf deliberately, uh, I think uh, wrote her as dumb and uh, she comes off that way. She, that's part of her arc. She starts off as, as a dumb, as a dimwit. Mm-hmm. And she's like uh, the, the character Jolenta in the book of the new sun, where someone a, a wizard comes up and puts a glamor on her. And now she's irresistible. And uh, the story just goes on from there. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the short uncollected short stories. I have so many uncollected short stories. This, um, going to the beach, I think, is such a really, really good so- short story. I think it came out in seventy three. Never been collected. Um, uh, there's a lot of stories actually that are a little cin- cinematic. Uh, King Rat mm-hmm. is a short story. It's never been c- collected. It was in the Gateways uh, anthology, and uh, yeah, yeah, I can see someone doing a a little short movie <laughs> uh, based on that. Um, he has his, you mentioned, you know, some science, his horror stories are really, you could do a lot with that. I, I, you can't always agree about what's once again, about what's happening in them. But uh, I think of the, uh, the werewolf in the uh, short story, uh, innocent. Mm, and yeah. Like, wow. That's a, <laughs> that is such an amazing, it, it, uh, it would be a to- it'd be one of these you know you have these categories of werewolves categories of vampire well that would be an entirely new category of werewolf and um so there yeah there's um it, show me something that's not being read a lot that's probably one that hasn't been that isn't being read enough mm. yeah my personal favorite i love his book castle view and that's one that a lot of people even even big wolf readers will be like ah oh, that one that it one was land me. across so, before there was a land across yeah 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 it was it was one that, but i actually think it's amazing it's just a midwestern story that happens to also be an arthurian story um, but all kinds of other craziness goes on but yeah lots of people don't like it they're like oh it's a bad novel it's just a bad characters blah 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 but i think i think it's fascinating but yeah everybody has that i mean a lot of his middle i guess the middle of his career novels the single novel like free live three or there are doors or um uh pandora by holly hollander I'm trying to remember. those yeah. are are often not talked about as much mm-hmm. um people talk about his later books because they're sometimes so frustrating and just because they're they're more recent but those middle books are the ones that are are in the forums and the groups that I think get the least attention probably, but there's lots of really interesting stuff that goes on in them. Yeah. I mean, often you get, it, it, I'm not sure what it is. For instance, uh, I remember after I read um, a devil in the forest, I I came and hit the earth list with a question um, who shot Gloin? And all I got were, you know, Lord of the Rings riffs <laughs> without anyone actually answering my questions. So I, I to this day, I don't know who shot Gloin. <laughs> one thing that i find interesting about wolf is his ability to take obscure theories and forgotten scientific counter theories i mean like whole riffs on lamarckianism and wolf uh, but also like hamlet's mill is you know may or may not be part of his you know overture that you've spent time on that um but he always seems to be but it's yeah. okay. You can use the word. <laughs> yeah. But there does seem to be, he did seem to be searching for him, like the, the, for lack of a better term, the detritus of science and, and failed science or offbeat science and, and really pulling at it. 
I think we forget, I mean, people bring it up, but I think we do often forget that he was an engineer and it's really important to some of his work because he's so literary minded that you're like, this guy had to, this, he couldn't have had a real job. Like, <laughs> and he totally did. And it does inform things occasionally, particularly in some of the short stories. What is your favorite weird, uh, other than Hamlet's Mill? Um, but actually, you, you, I'll, I'll, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. That you think informs Wolf that's kind of wild and... There's no key to Wolf. I, I don't want anyone to think that like you're going to find a, a secondary text and you're just going to understand it because like that's not going to happen. Sorry. What are these like secondary outside things really enriches Wolf for you? And obviously, you can talk about Hamlet's Mill, but maybe <laughs> something else too. <laughs> just but, on that, I, I will have lots and lots, lots more to say about Hamlet's Mill coming up. Not only in the podcast because we're going to do the, the tale of the student and his son, but also uh, in other channels. So I'll, I'll leave that aside. Okay. I, uh, I do think that Wolf is, is a traditional Catholic who is most likely to have ideas about Christianity that would get him burned at the stake in another era. Uh, so he is an autodidact. He picks up anything that occurs. Obviously, um, everyone knows that Borges is an influence on Wolf, but you know, we've been doing uh, readings of Borges in the uh, on the Patreon side, and I'm really struck by the potentiality that Wolf was um, attracted by the idea of uh, pantheistic idealism. So mm -hmm. it it comes up in a lot of ways, and it. It's kind of it's kind of got me thinking about some events uh, coming up in Book of the New Sun, in the Book of Long Sun, that you know, I wonder. <laughs> so I, which I don't know. I mean, I yeah, he was a. If you would ask him, are you a good Catholic? He would say yes, yes. I'm sure he would have. Uh, in fact, he he did. But he was going to think what he was going to think. And mm -hmm. so yeah, I'll, I, I'll say Borges. Read Borges, and you're going to get a lot. Not just not just the the novels with the labyrinths and the mirrors and the, the, you know, whatever, but the, the essays. And I think you'll see a lot that will inform your, your reading of Wolf. Yeah. The one thing that to me is interesting about his outside reading, it seems was that James used the word autodidact. And I think that's perfect for him because anytime he would get interested in the topic, he didn't necessarily follow it in terms of like the, the necessary greatest hits books that you read to get the foundation that everybody kind of agrees. Okay. These are the, these are the canonical things. And then we can go from there, you know, like Lamarck, he was, he would be like, yeah, I'm, I believe thoroughly in evolution, but I actually think Lamarck makes more sense. And so immediately he's like a minority opinion on a majority opinion. And I think that's kind of what, is so interesting about the way that he approached things. And it's one reason why I say over and over again, that I desperately wish we knew what was in his library or could see what he, what he had checked out or what books he bought um, just to know the specific things. Like what was his particular, what were his favorite re references for mythology? Yeah. Like, you know, because I'm sure that the ways he thought about mythology, he wouldn't read Edith Hamilton. You know, he had yeah. something specific that that was a little bit different. The same with a lot of his sort of scientific work and like Hamlet's Mill. Like it to me, Hamlet's Mill makes total sense to be the kind of thing that Wolf would be into because it's incredibly hard, incredibly difficult, but it's not at all sort of a mainstream academic take on oh mythology oh did i disappear yeah you froze for a minute that's okay. oh sorry sorry but um <laughs> at least on my side i don't know <laughs> but you're fine but yeah but that's that's so i don't know exactly but the one thing i i would like to know more about is i've always been interested in his like james said sort of heterodox christian reading because he definitely did and he certainly knew about kabbalah and he certainly knew a little bit about gnosticism and if i could know what he had actually read in some of those ways, I would love to know. And the only yeah. reason we know Hamlet's Mill is because of one quote in Book of the Long Sun. The book of Short Sun, yeah. Short, short Sun, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he quoted. But, you know, bring up Hamlet's Mill, if just because you know what the book is sitting on his shelf doesn't mean you know what he carried away from it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't follow Hamlet's Mill, you know, trap chapter and verse. He took it, 
picked it up and he just followed and went off, did his own thing with it. He had, had other pri- other important aspects. He has, Generally, yes, he follows it. You can see over and over in his stories that, uh, oh, look, it's another revolution. <laughs> it's a, mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, he is, he, is, he is following the story. Oh, look, it's another character, another uh, protagonist with a dog. But he was still doing his own his own thing. He wasn't saying, oh, I'm going to bring out this little paragraph in Hamlet's Mill, and then I'm going to make a story out of it. No, he was making, he was taking a kind of a general idea of the hero and carrying it on. Yeah. I, I think, you know, we always talk about remixes and he, there's a way in which he is such a, an artist with this stuff that the, if he was doing music, the remix would be so different from any of the source the source samples that you would never know Mm -hmm. like Uh what the original source samples were except that they're there like Uh somewhere i mean when you read book of the new sun you're like there's got to be not there has to be gnostic stuff going on (laughs) there are gnostic words there's weird saints we're in we're in a we're in a universe that doesn't there's no way this is a a orthodox catholic universe there's just that absolutely no way and yet I can't tell you what form of Gnosticism he's pulling from. Like, I really can't. No. And, you know, it's maybe he's not, but it's definitely there somewhere. Yeah. Um, no, I definitely I've called the the solar cycle the uh, the Narnia of Gnosticism. <laughs> and uh, that uh, I mean, it's there. You could you can argue about what the, what it means, what Wolf means by it. But. It, it it it's there. It goes goes over through the entire uh, solar cycle. The Book of the Long Sun, the, uh, the Book of the Long Sun that is a Gnostic world in every way. Uh, but then you go on to the Wizard Knight, and look at that. You've got it again. Yeah. Yep, you got a Gnostic, but this time with Norse characteristics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's okay. he's something he talked about. He would he talked about especially when he was primarily writing short stories that if he was stuck on an idea he'd just go take some other story or novel and he'd be like all right i'm just going to make a sci-fi version of i don't know a uh, noel coward play or something <laughs> you know and would but it wasn't like he was saying i'm just going to dress it up a little bit and it's really the noel coward it would just be a way to to get him get his imagination working in some other way so that by the time it's done it's the kind of thing where even if you go in and recognize, oh, this thing is is shaped kind of like a uh, Jack London story. That doesn't necessarily give you a key to solve what's going on because he's changed so much stuff that that only half of it is going to be connected to that at a certain point. So so that's where with Wolf, sort of literary illusions and things like that don't necessarily give you a whole lot of insight into exactly what he's thinking because he's not necessarily, you know, borrowing something in order to say, and now this, if you recognize this that, will have that's to a happen. key. Yeah. That, that you can <laughs> no, he tricks it. you. He'll, he'll twist it at the end or yeah, he'll yeah. do it in some unbelievable way that, that you, you'll never be able to convince anyone that he's actually done it. Yeah. So trust me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, um, this will be the last question, but it, it, you might, it might be, uh, it has a lot of places to open up. How much do you feel like your views of the new sun have changed by podcasting about it? A lot, a lot. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I didn't, as, as came up in the podcast, book of the new sun was never even ranking as my favorite wolf novel. I ranked mm. it high. I if, if, if Wolf's worst novels were the were the worst no- novels and stories that we were ever going to get in literature, we would be very very lucky. Mm-hmm. But it was probably number five of all my favorites, so it's kind of moving up. I I see it. In my interpretation of it now is that it's a much more groundbreaking uh, novel. It, it breaks the it redefines the novels in much the way that a that the fifth out of Cerberus does. Um I when we started I expected that we would just basically be categorizing all the things we didn't understand as we went through. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I was very surprised that when we got to the end of the Shadow of the Torturer that most of my biggest questions, not all of them, but most of my biggest questions about that volume have been answered for me. But um, 
I don't, I'm, I'm kind of afraid that's not going to happen for Claw the Conciliator, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was very successful for the first volume. Yeah. So, yeah. What was interesting to me was how much my sense of the shape of the book changed. Because we talked about over and over again in Shadow of the Torture, there's a character named Asia who's kind of deceiving the main character at one point. Um, but I didn't realize quite how central she was to everything that happens after he meets her. Like that's an example of when I mean the shape of the book, like just the, the way the story is organized. Um, things like that totally changed my perspective. Like before I thought, oh, it's obviously Severian's the central thing. But now as I look at Shadow of the Torture, so much of it is him being manipulated by another character in, in a lot of ways. So small things like that surprised me, but I think that's just inevitable when you go so slowly through something. I mean, if we're talking for an hour, hour and a half, about six or seven pages, you know, every other week, then yeah, you're, you're definitely going to have a, a different <laughs> sense of the pacing and the tone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm still waiting to get towards the end to see whether or not my ideas about what's going on overall in the larger backstory change or not. And I truly don't know whether they're they're going to at this point mm -hmm. but but yeah there definitely is a second story behind Severian's story that you're you're being asked to put together throughout the book and i'm already finding ways that i'm changing a lot of assumptions i used to have about what that had to be so yeah Hmm. Well, I can tell you going through it with you guys cuz i've listened since the first episode that it's made me more interested in the book of the new sun because because it was everyone's introduction to it i kind of did the hipster thing where you're just like well you know it's the book of the new sun everybody loves that i'm gonna go <laughs> i'm gonna go like be really into uh soldier in the mist and um yeah uh, oh, yeah. yeah yeah and i'm gonna argue that the land across is the most amazing book ever <laughs> ever written even though i Where don't understand go? a word of it <laughs> um <laughs> like i i actually i find that one of the things I love about Wolf is, is the sense of frustration actually paying off, even though it is still frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. There are other novelists where I get frustrated and I don't feel like there's ever a payoff. And when I, you know, I, I listen to you guys riff on the theories and some of the times I'm like, clearly James is insane. Um, but <laughs> you're, you're not alone. In, in that idea. Um, I, I don't think so. I think certainly other people. Do. <laughs> but then I'm like, every now and then I'm like, but there's so much this insanity now makes sense of that. Mm -hmm. I had no way That's to approach trick. this before. Yeah. <laughs> Listen long enough. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And we get that a lot. Like there, we definitely have people who are like, ah, I just the the whole sort of speculation thing just drives me nuts and whatnot. And yet there are times it does solve questions and it does open up other avenues. Yeah, you know, James's and other people's who do that kind of crazy wild speculation on Wolf that most of the time it may take you in strange places. But but there are plenty of times, too, where it's made connections or it solved something that now I think has to be true. And the so, Mar Winner debates yeah. opened a whole bunch of stuff for me. Cause yeah, before that, I, I was like, this is just mind. weird. I don't care. Yeah. Like, I think I, it was obvious what happened. And now and I said, Oh, I was totally wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not that everyone agrees. They still yeah. don't. There's still the debate goes on. Yeah. But um, it's rare that you have a book that can lend itself to that. And like you said, that can frustrate you and still be fascinating. And that's, that's why I'm fascinated. That's why he, he grabs me. Um, so I would like to tell my listeners to check out your podcast, Rereading Wolf. Um, there's also good stuff on the patron side. And you guys are not you're not greedy with your patron levels. So people should definitely support you. I do personally. Thank so, you. And we um, thank you. Yeah. And I am I am I am loving listening to someone else be be productively baffled by the land across. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> so there there's that and i i think one of the things that that the benefit to that kind of podcast is and i i, I also love i i don't there's a third it, there's three right there's yeah. three yeah yeah three, one of which i haven't listened podcasts to only devoted to that yeah 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 one of which i haven't listened to so i have no like bias against them but um are for them but 
Um, I would actually I suggest haven't, I haven't railed against them yet, yeah. <laughs> unlike um, the other two. Well, actually, I think I think it's actually really interesting to listen to what Clay People Media does and what you guys do because the approach is so very different. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they do do interpretive work, but it's it's they see it, it's you know, and you're both you're both going through it slowly. Although you're going through it like almost page by page and they're going through it chapter by chapter and uh, slightly, slightly faster, but it's, it's a very, if people want to engage with it, it's a very good way to, to engage with a book that I really do think benefits from discussion. I don't think Wolf is something uh, weirdly. He is one of those authors that I think, behooves communal experience oddly because you need mm-hmm. to talk about it to begin to process what you're reading yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's true well no i wouldn't be a big as big a fan i think if it hadn't been for that that email list the earth list i mean once i found that and found other people to throw ideas back and forth that just encourages you to go reread more because you've got people you can share ideas with and ask questions for and when you have a theory you can put it out there and and that's why we spend such a long time too at the beginning of each episode talking about all the comments or questions that people have asked just because that's why we got into it. And we definitely wanted to make that be a part of us, not just, not just our reading through it, but everybody else's reactions and questions. And it it doesn't really work without them. Really. Um, We would, Craig and I uh, do not read the books the same way. Mm -hmm. We would just spend our time chasing each other around in a circle. Mm -hmm. And when people comment, they they correct us. They change my mind, mm-hmm. and they make me recognize something I didn't see before. And it takes a lot of people to look at this elephant. And so, yeah, we we we, we, for, you know, we mentioned we have a, a Patreon site. That when a very uh, nice listener said, "You guys should just you know put it behind a paywall. People would pay to <laughs> to listen." I said, "Well, yeah, but." <laughs> It doesn't really work, but unless we yeah. get a lot of people listening and commenting and straightening us out. So, yeah. 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 Well, it's a great show and I was glad to have you on. And I'm, I'm always trying to get more people to read Gene Wolf because while he's not a secret, he's not, you know, the, I wouldn't say like some super obscure cult author. Um, I, I don't for how, for how weird and kind of amazing he is. Like I, like I don't know why he's not at least on the level of like a JG Ballard. Um and for mm-hmm. the people who know him he is, but culturally, yeah. yeah. He's not. Yeah. No, the fan base is 3 feet wide and about a mile deep. <laughs> right. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, thank you for your time and I uh, hope you do have a good evening. I know it's late. Thanks for having us in. Thanks. Yeah. That's awesome. I'll tell you when it's uh when it's done and edited and I'll I'll give it to you guys and we will re- demand retractions at that. So <laughs> fair. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm looking forward to it. And like I said, I'm a fan. I've literally listened to every episode that you guys have done on the free channel. And I'm going through most of the stuff on the Patreon. I'm Thank even, you. it took me a while to get into the, the brief interviews with it, but I'm even into that now. Cause I'm like, Oh, I, Cool. How how do we all? Get I love weird? those. That's the I would I would give up the rest of the podcast just to do those. I love those. <laughs> like, how do we all get weird? Oh, yeah. now, now now we're basically no, doing no. case studies and how we all got weird. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> all right. Well, have a good night, guys. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Night. Oh, there we go. Okay. And thank you for listening to Varm Blog. If you'd like more. You can find us on YouTube in the show notes. For early audio access with ad-free, unexpurged audio, as well as additional show notes episodes and Q&A sessions, please visit our Patreon, where we have three levels of support. If you can't support us financially, we'd love your support in other ways. You can rate or review us at Apple Podcast or any podcast aggregator to help get our profile up, and you can share our videos on social media. We are affiliated with the Emancipation Network, a radical educational podcast network and research collective. If you'd like to check out our sister shows, From Alpha to Omega, General Intellect Unit, Swap Side Chat, Jumpsuit Utopia, 
Mortal Science. Check them out at emancipation.network. And this was your host, T. Derek Varn. Thanking our crew, um, Paul Channel Strip, all our friends at Emancipation Network, and Bitter Lake for providing our music. Check out Bitter Lake in the show notes, as well as Jason Miles' show, This Is Revolution, which provided us with the visual intro you will see on the YouTube channel. Thank you, and we hope to see you again very soon.